We're throwing off the filters of tradition and culture to discover what the Bible really says about our relationships, relationships with God, with ourselves, and with others. Welcome to this episode of Relationship Truth Unfiltered. Welcome. I am Leslie Vernick, and today we're talking with Jim Cress. Now, I've known Jim for a very long time, and he does some amazing work helping individuals and couples caught in the destructive cycle of sexual addiction. Jim is a licensed therapist with a thriving practice in North Carolina. He's a certified sexual addiction counselor and a certified partner trauma therapist. But what you might not know is that Jim is not just a counselor with a great professional expertise, but he also has acknowledged that he's an addiction in this area. So welcome, Jim. And can you start our time together by telling us more of your story and how you move from a place of needing help to one of helping others? Well, yeah, Leslie, we have known each other a long time and thank you. It's a true joy to be with you uh, and your audience. And, you know, as you and I have spoken for the American Association of Christian Counselors for maybe a million years, if not a long time. <laughs> it, uh, it says how old we are. Yeah. <laughs> well, we've done that. We try to do a little good. I tell people, you know, whatever you bring in, it's true about you and your work. But I tell people, you know, we have more help and hope than you have problems. So I want to offer that, that there's hope. And, you know, no matter how good my PowerPoint is at a conference or what I say, the line that people want to come up if they want to talk to me, and if Jessica, who you know, my wife, is sitting there, they're wanting to know because I always put my story out first, not the full thing, but a Cliff Notes version. And they're going to say, how'd you get out? How'd you yeah. get through? How'd you change? And, and they're coming in. If you dare speak in a public setting, especially at a counseling conference, on the topic of pornography, sexual addiction, partner trauma, whatever, uh, I know without being disrespectful to audiences that there'll be a fair amount of people there for their own struggles. So I'm mindful of that and people come up and uh, maybe it's the proverbial, I'm asking for a friend. So I love sharing that part of my story because people are saying, can you be real? Or are you just some clinical expert out of the book? So I grew up in the home fifth of six kids. Mom wanted two kids. I always tell people I work with what was the environment or milieu you were born in. And so she was very clear about it. She only wanted two. When you're number five, what's that mean about me? Severe, obviously for me, lack of attachment, a lack of healthy attachment, basically punted to my older sisters to raise me. So there's that vacuum. Dad, uh, I had an older brother, 15 years older than me, three girls than me. And he was out of gas time he came to me. Classic story, never did anything with me except some in my, uh, you know, in the corporal punishment of whipping me with a belt, but no involvement. So, you know, in pure and undefiled religion is to care for widows and orphans. I was what I call an internal orphan. Dad was around. It wasn't external that he was gone, but I just, he never did any, literally anything with me. To his credit, he's in heaven now. He took us to church, and I never want to miss that. So mom, nurturing and the attachment thing that we know so much about, nothing, which set up me with you know, a lifetime anxious attachment style. And so glad my sisters were there and at one level, my older brother, but they weren't designed to be my parents. That grew up at age four. And I have a picture on my desk right in front of me that I keep here, me and my siblings. When I'm age four, I was sexually abused by some older boys and um, out in broad daylight. And that happened. I didn't know that till years deep in my own therapy, which I've done 20 years of therapy off and on as a client uh, where the therapist said, you know, that's called sex abuse. I knew the story. Somebody listening today will say, well, this happened to me, but I do fact and impact on what happened. The fact that happened to you impact, what did it do to you? That's where a lot of therapy work is. So I uh, introduced into the sexuality of like, what, what's even, what's that about? Age 12, 11, 12 introduced to pornography uh, and that story where in our a Baptist Christian home, there was no pornography, but uh, the boy knew enough to coach me. He said, your mom gets those catalogs, Sears, Montgomery Wards, you old timers know those catalogs. <laughs> and that became my arousal template, we call it, of, of its own pornography. It's all pornography if I objectify it that way, which set up um, an acting out to that, that um, went on clear up through Bible college, seminary, getting ordained, having a career as a Christian broadcaster. I'm 18 years sober in that recovery now. So, but, and, and so I was in this and I had this split life. I never wanted to be a phony. I've worked with some men who do, they love the, 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 the trickery and they want to deceive. I've just felt full of shame so much. 
And I say that shame, S-H-A-M-E, is self-hatred at my expense. I just hated myself, felt like a fraud. I was uh, proverbially looking, ever looking for an external solution to my internal problem. And so, but what I had is a strong scripture memory, an independent Baptist background, lots of time in the word and all that. But then this secret life I couldn't shake. I thought, again, looking for an external solution to my internal problem, Christian Bible College would do it. It didn't. And I found that I could still lust and act out there, even though I couldn't get to real pornography. Then I thought if I could marry the woman of my dreams, you know, I was a music major. I wanted to marry a piano playing girl. I did. And I thought <laughs> that would solve it, which it did for about three months until one night, basically it was said, you, you're not, we're not having sex tonight. And all of a sudden I went back to just cheap TV, whatever I could find. Uh, I'm as a recovering sex addict could objectify anything. And it was back. I thought it was gone because, you know, I was and many men I've worked with thinking their wife will be, you know, if they'll just have sex and it will solve the problem. And so it came back. And of course, there was discovery on her part. I would stop. I would start. I would stop. Uh, kids come into the picture. And even while I'm even in Christian ministry, just could not stop till a uh, dear mentor that I spent a lot of time with. Uh, Dr. Larry Crabb said one time at Opryland Hotel, he said, part of you might want to. I said, Larry, I don't want to look at bad things on TV tonight. I'm struggling. And Larry and I could always be real. He was like a father to me. And he said, well, what else is in you? Because people want to know, how would you begin to change? And I said, I, uh, he said, part of you wants to think about looking or acting out to pornography. What else is true? And I said, I don't want to do that against Jessica or the boys. And he said, You've got to, and he took me to Colossians 3, which I use all the time. The word of God says, mortify the deeds of the flesh. You've got to kill it, but then give life to what's alive in you. The Puritans called it mortify and vivify. And he began to say, you've got to truly not just say, which dog do you say sick him to, or which one do you feed the most? And you've got to give life to what's truly more alive in you. That set me on a course. I had a few slip up some 20 years ago but got me on real recovery and then a lot of therapy including trauma healing therapy and Jessica and I in couples therapy to get to the point where I was able to really heal and then God gave me a ministry to a lot of broken men and couples. Wow that's powerful and I think so many of our listeners especially men who might be listening or women who might be caught in a sexual addiction yeah. can find freedom in your story Jim because it can happen to good people who just mm -hmm don't True. want to do it, but they're caught. The Galatians 6 1 says they're caught in a trespass <clears throat> and their yeah. ability to get out by themselves is not possible. Tell us more. How does this sexual addiction impact relationships, especially your marriage? Because a lot of men think, well, if she doesn't know, it won't hurt her. It's a secret. I do it all by myself. She's not going to be impacted. But how does it impact the marriage? Yeah. Thank you, Liz. It's such a profound question as I work with wives. When we use the word partner. It's just the term we use now because it could be a girlfriend. Sometimes a woman's unfaithful, and it's the <clears throat> partner. That's the connotation if I say partner trauma stuff. So what I found is more uh, anecdotally in working with people is, uh, as I've said often, if there's smoke, I smell smoke, there's got to be probably a fire. Most women I've worked with, certainly not all, have said that, I'll say, did you see even one little bit of sign? And by the way, I don't pathologize them or call them the co-addict and say, you know, I saw even in dating he was in porn, but I thought marriage would solve it. Or I saw this, or I saw a text, or even lipstick on a shirt. And I thought, well, maybe. So while one cannot gaslight uh, oneself, it's close to it. Uh, gaslighting, of course, and your listeners probably know that well, is uh, I, have, I know the truth, and I'm trying to really monkey with your mind and get you to think that you're crazy. I have the intent to deceive but women would say, I saw the sign and I just didn't want to look and I didn't want to look any further or I prayed about it or some even Christian woman said, you know, all men struggle with this, you know, uh, not necessarily the best words of every man's battle because it can't prove it's every man's battle and what you do with that. So there are lies or stuff that people believe. And um, the impact is what happens. The two D words is far more damaging when a wife has discovery she comes up and now it's like, oh, no, I've seen the text or whatever. Then disclosure where a guy comes and says, I need to get clean with you. What I'm about to tell you, hopefully in front of a therapist, here's what I've done. And I take couples through you know, a full formal disclosure of what they've done. When it's discovery and she finds it out, 
especially if she finds it out and he looks right in the face of it. Do you know I've worked with people, no joke, where the wife caught the husband in bed with another person and the guy literally says one, two, three, all together now out of his mouth, honey, it's not what you think. <laughs> what? I'm at the scene of the crime. They're disconnected from their prefrontal cortex when they're doing that. It's like, what are you doing? So her world is rocked. And then a big thing I see a lot of, of course, is revisionist history as it should be done, that she'll revise the history back. And if he does a disclosure or not, what she's discovered, and she will say, you were doing pornography. I always take couples back to their engagement and dating time. They don't want to go there. Some guys don't know what was going on there. And he was in porn back there. So she'll revise the history and say, if I don't know better, this whole marriage is a fraud. And I think marriage 1.0 is over at that moment and decide, can we come through ground zero and, and build marriage 2.0? And the last thing is I do these trauma eggs with people. It's their life story and pictures. And I tell guys that uh, I hold this airplane up. You and I are on a screen together. And I'll say, you landed your plane on her runway. And that runway, you don't even know her story of previous betrayal. So it's PTSD for her previous. She was exposed to pornography. Girls can be, she was uh, sexually abused or whatever. So I tell the guys, it's like a pebble in the pond. You thought, well, I just did this and I'm sorry, but it's ripped back open her whole story that most guys don't know. They've never heard their wife's story. Total soup to nuts. So the post-traumatic stress stuff has to be revisions history and the PTSD part has to be addressed. And then me, I did it with Jessica. There are levels, here I am talking to the expert, you, uh, there are levels of verbal and emotional abuse, and I memorized so much scripture as a young man, and I used that. My verbal and emotional abuse was 1 Corinthians 7 is in the Bible, and that's what is in there, defraud not. Even in the King James, I'd quote it, and would pressure her into feeling, well, she must, be able, must have to have sex. That's horrific verbal and emotional abuse that I did to her, and other mm -hmm. things. So rarely do I see a guy who is in sexual acting out Rarely have I met a guy like that who does not have the verbal and emotional abuse going on. It's all abuse, but it's in there. Yeah. I think the church has been slow to recognize the impact of someone's sexual addiction on yeah. the partner. It's mm -hmm. sort of like, well, he's sorry, so you need to forgive and let's forgive rebuild and move this on. marriage. Yeah, right. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I appreciate that you care about the victim and the woman and the impact mm -hmm. on her. And, and it is ground zero. The ma marriage is ground zero. And whether it can be rebuilt or not, we don't know, because each of them have their own work to do. Each of I them say that. Well, if I may say, I do. you can see my fingers coming together. And I'm ordained as a pastor. I've married couples. And I say the two become one, but the one are still two. There's still two people involved in this thing that... And guys, but, but she must come back and or people saying, you need to forgive and you need to, and I say, she needs to get over here and you know this well and do her own work and decide, can I come back? And um, do you know Ed Welch? Mm -hmm. Well, Ed gave me this, which I like, and I do this with clients. Don't anybody panic. He said this, and I said, I'm using that. And he said, sometimes I take the word of God, the Bible. I do a lot of biblical counseling when I'm doing he said, and I put it under my couch. I've got a rug in front of me and where my clients sit in front. And I'll put it under there and say, look, for a moment, we're putting the Bible away. I just want to get real. And even Jesus, the woman in the well, I've got a statue of that over here on my table. And say, we're, we'll bring the Bible back out. But right, the Bible doesn't say, do you have grounds? I go, let's put that away. We'll bring it back up. But I want to just talk because I found out in therapy years ago, people in the end end up doing what they want to do. So I say, I want her to have her space in her you know, sanctuary over here, her city of refuge, to get her wits about her to say, can I really go back into this and to examine the facts and the impact of what he's done? And that usually for me takes time, like a separation if it's needed for her to be in quarantine safely, intensive care unit to explore that. Then I'll bring the Bible back out, right? Yeah. So Jim, probably the majority of our audience is someone who might be married to an abuser or an addict. What are some best practices? Once she is in discovery, she's in the midst of this betrayal awareness. Wow, he's not who I thought I, he was. My marriage isn't what I thought it was. Yeah. Um, what are some best practices for her not to become sick herself with worry, sick trying to change him, sick with anger and resentment? What are some things that she needs to do when we talk about her own work? She may have her own trauma history and all of that, but she's got some yeah. immediate work to do uh, to not get caught in his story and just try to manage that in her own body. One of the things I borrowed from a very dear friend of mine, um, 
you've heard of her, her name's Leslie Vernick. She'll say, <laughs> because she's earned the right to say it, and she's a woman and she's compassionate, what is your problem with his problem? I don't lead with that every time, but I use that. So I want her to get support immediately. It's Nehemiah chapter 3, next to her, next to him, next to her on the wall, life on the wall. She needs support. I want her then <clears throat> you know, to, to have safety about things. Um, I go right down the line of saying if there's been infidelity that's crossed physical lines, for her to stop all sexuality with him, get an STD test proactively. Some people are like, what? But for her to find a good therapist, and, and I say a therapist who understands the things you understand and who understands partner trauma of that, uh, that model, for her to go in and just say, I want to look at the facts and the impact, what it's done to me, what it's done to my whole life story before that, that PTSD thing, and for her to find some good support. To, I do that. with. But I get to work with a lot of wives and letting them slowly, we're going to slowly unpack, which is why most of my work are three-day intensives seldom 50 minute hour and we can unpack all that story and where she has a place just to process like the jewish people have sitting shiva she can just in out hold space i use my little hub with the women h-u-b h i hear you you i understand you b i believe you that's one of the things that's been publicly announced that our mutual friend lisa turkers when i said in the midst of crisis said i believe you she said it was the most helpful thing that was a simple thing but it was true i just said you know, because they're wondering. I find a lot of wives will say, partner trauma, do you believe I'm telling the truth? So get them their space for them to work on that, to uh, establish safety. If the husband, if there's a husband involved, is to, to get where he would be in his own therapy. She can't mandate that. But I want them to have a full formal disclosure because her mind can make up worse stories that are there or the actual stories. She deserves it. If she's going to be able to pick, do I go back in that relationship? Uh, I need, and that doesn't usually happen right away because I want him to do his work. There's a formal way for her to come getting therapy then like with her therapist. And, you know, uh, I do use in my office a lot polygraphs. They're standard in our field. Some people are like, what? And for the guy telling the truth, it's actually a simple process for her to get. If she's going to go, the walls are down, the uh, twin towers are down. She's going to go rebuild. We've got to get her over to a sane, sol solid foundation for her to sort through her own stuff. And often there is that physical separation where, where they're not just back with each other that night. And it's safety for her to do that and then to go do her own work way before they try to do couples work, right? I love that you say that, Jim, because <clears throat> I think so many Christian counselors are so concerned with immediately saving the marriage. But you said you can't build a new marriage on a faulty foundation. Yeah, And so right. if that foundation is broken or cracked or full of lies and deceptions and betrayals, and those aren't addressed and dealt with, um, you can't build a new relationship on that because mm -hmm. there's still safety and trust issues. And so it takes time to excavate the damage and see what caused all that yeah. damage. And, True. and then she has to have the right to say, I don't think I want to rebuild because mm -hmm. the damage is too great. The trust broken is too strong. I still don't trust or can't be safe with him. And, and I don't trust think will be rebuilt give... over time plus provable, reliable experience. The time factor for me, and it's in all the research and training I've had, is crucial. Reagan said to Gor uh, Gorbachev, Dovarai no provarai. In Russian proverb, he said, trust but verify. I will trust, but I have to verify. The more verification I can get and over time and watch, we have a term in the field called eroticized rage, where you talk about verbal and emotional abuse and a destructive marriage or a destructive partner, a male, whatever, husband, that part is over time, most guys can hold their breath for a short amount of time. That's why for me, the time factor is so big to give time for her to heal and see if he says, I've had about enough of this. You need to come back. And the deacon, the elder or the pastor says, you need to come back in here. And I say, no, you, she's in an intensive care unit. Are you going to walk into an intensive care room with your wife and feed her a pizza or rip her tubes out and say, you're coming out here, AMA, as we call it, against medical advice? No, I wouldn't do that in intensive care and leave her alone. Let her do her work. I don't want her to be by herself. I want her to do the right amount of work and let her have that space for her to choose to say, I'm willing now to begin to come back, but not coming back prematurely. Yeah, I think that sometimes therapists or well-meaning pastors, good people, you know, are so sure he's really sorry that mm -hmm. they're not validating the very real impact that his yeah. behavior has had True. on her and her ability to 
want to even try again. Maybe he is doing his work, but the trust has been so damaged. She Can might I speak not to that real him. quick? Yeah, That is do. one of my favorite things I'm glad you brought up. I know it's well-meaning. People have the triangle. You're here at the bottom, and your wife is here at the bottom. And if you move up, Christ is at the top, then you'll get closer. I have had experientially, in healthy ways, and I now teach this to couples. I'm saying, hey, I'm Ezekiel, the watchman on the wall. I'm going to warn you and to say that she might heal, you might change and become just shy of Jesus. And change can be validated past polygraphs. And everybody says, no, he Leslie Byrne says he's changed. That does not mean, because guys will say, like, I've won her back or whatever. That does not mean that she will say, she might look and say, you've really, really changed. And I see it and believe it. The kids have even said, you are different. And I'm not going to return to the relationship. Because guys yeah. will go, if I've changed, we're hunter-gatherers. We've done everything else. So we should win the Super Bowl. No, you be who you are. And she, leave her alone to see if she circles back and picks you. But there, I've learned there's just no guarantees with that, right? Right. And one of the things I've learned, and I, we teach our women, is that if he's demanding something of you, then he hasn't done enough of his work. So good. Right. If yeah. he's demanding something of you, if he feels entitled to yeah. your trust yeah. or your body or your reconciliation, then he's still not done his work because he still has no idea the impact he's caused. True. Yeah. You know, he should be and grateful. I see that a lot. Yeah. And I'm with you. That's what I call, that's the dashboard on their marriage. If not the dashboard on his life, if he comes back now, if he has a moment where he demands, says, I'm really, I'm just frustrated for every rip in a relationship that needs to be repair. People I believe get to be human. He says, can I back that up? I'm sorry. That's just going to do that. I'll do a lot and say, babe, that's me being a jerk or that's my stuff coming out. Do you want to back that up? And I go, yeah, can I do that? She said, yes, you may. And I said, I don't, I know out of the abundance of a heart, a man speaketh, but there's also something deeper below that. I don't want to do that. I don't know if I'm tired, whatever. I don't want to give an excuse, but I'd like a redo. And she says, you may do that, but she knows I'm consistent. I'm not perfect. But if a guy does that, I go, he may say, oh, I'm just frustrated. Why won't you come back? Okay, hang on a second. I'd like a redo. But if a guy's there and that demanding stuff, you see it, the rage in his eyes or the whatever, he's held the beach ball underwater long enough and when that beach ball comes up like what you see on my screen. See that? A mm -hmm. grenade. A grenade. Mm -hmm. The beach ball hill underwater will come up like a grenade. I'm going, wow. So I'll see it. Guys, I don't think we're that good. We'll show it. If you look in our eyes or, or something, we're like, we've had about enough of this waiting around. I've healed. Well, let's get on with it. Right. Nope. Yeah. And Jim, you said something really powerful that I just want to emphasize is that if you're working together to reconcile this relationship and rebuild broken trust to whatever level it is, the man, the abuser, the one who has the history of abuse, but both people in the marriage have to have a healthy degree of self-awareness. So yeah. as you said to Jessica in that moment, hey, babe, that's not how I wanted to show up. I don't know what's gotten into me, but that can I have a do over that shows change. Yes. That shows change. And that's what helps rebuild trust. Not that you're perfect, but that when you are cruel or harsh or impatient or sinful or destructive, not only she sees it, you see it. That's and you don't blame important. her. You own it. You take responsibility for it. And that builds trust because nobody lives with a perfect person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then for me also, on my side of the equation, to not be surprised where years later, because a lot of guys will be like, Okay, and she's do, she's doing better now. She's moved back in. I am doing better. We have therapy. We're doing all the things, and it's like good job. And then one day she had a bad thing because she heard Leslie Vernick or Sherry Keffer or Jim Cress or in a book or read Lisa's Good Boundaries and Goodbyes or something or heard of nothing else. And she said, "You know what? Not that person. Now they fell into pornography, or pornography or, or infidelity, and that's a PTSD thing." She comes back and says, "What's going on?" And she's like. I'm just kind of re-triggered back to our old stuff. I'm like, oh, really? I mean, aren't we past that? And I, so you know, I say, no, he says, T babe, three words. He says, tell me more. Inside the guy's like, oh, man. I say, buddy, you know, before Christ, you haven't done anything new wrong for the rest of your life. When Nathan said, David, there's the deal. Thou art the man. But do you know, you know, the word of God says, hey, Dave, the sword will never depart your house. That's important because the consequences may go on for a life. If we T-boned you in a real intersection, wife, and your hip was shattered, the barometer changes and your hip hurts. I didn't hit you again. It's like, no, for the rest of your life, at some level, live your life, grace of God, but the sword may never depart your house. That's yes. uh, it, who knows how long it could be 30 years later. She could be re-triggered. 
I love that. Jim, there's people who are listening right now. And I love, you know, you mentioned Lisa Turkhurst. I love how she's so honest with her awareness of her part, not that she caused any pornography for him or any of his right. problem, but but her passivity, her long suffering, all of the yeah. virtues that Christian women think are what they're supposed to do in these kind of situations. And then they wake up and say, wait a minute, I'm done mm-hmm. with that. I've got to speak up. How might a woman speak into this problem that she knows her husband has, they've never talked about it because she's been too scared. And of course, he's not going to talk about it. How can she speak into his problem in a wise way? What might you recommend Mm -hmm. that she could see that you have seen has worked in some cases? It doesn't work in every case. Jesus spoke to Judas and it didn't work. But (laughs) what might be something she could say? Well, I go back to a very close friend of mine. She borrows the words and uses them differently of Leslie Vernick's words, well, what is your problem with his problem? She says, and I hope it's Ephesians 4.15. It doesn't always work. We get to be human, right? Uh, speaking the truth in a love, in love, in agape love, seeking his highest good, bold love, James Dobson's old tough love, whatever words you want to put in there. And she says, here is my problem with your problem. I will not live with that anymore. Boundaries are to keep me safe, not to manage you, husband. I, this is my, I'll answer Leslie's question. This is my problem with your problem. And I'm not going to do that anymore. I know we're going to go real high here. Watch. See, husband, if I stay and enable or just allow you to do that, there's a chance that I am an accomplice to your crime against me and against yourself. Loving you well, God divorced Israel. And you all go, here we go. And, and, and Paul turns such a one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh is I love you so much that I won't co-operate with you anymore. She's not in a judgment. She's actually quite in empathy there. And she can say, I've got to go figure some things out. Some people do what I use called a slip protocol. SLIP stands for short lapse in progress. And I work with couples. Some people don't like it and say, if this happens again, We prepare in times of strength for coming times of weakness. If this happens again, I already have the plan enacted of what we will do. And I have to write it out. And so we do that. And she says, I must keep myself safe. If there are children safe, keep them safe. If there's a flesh line crossed at any level, including massage parlors or something else, then I cannot allow, I'm not going to allow myself to risk an STD or an STI that I am really carrying that the rest of my life, even after a divorce. So I love you enough to say, I won't go along with this anymore. That's part of it. And that's very loving of the guy. I think that's so powerful. And that requires some work on the woman's part. Of course. Those of you who are listening to get the true idea of what his helpmate means to help Mm -hmm. him isn't to help him go down the tubes in sinful (laughs) destruction to help by being passive and allowing it, but helping him say, I'm not going to partner with you in this. I'm not going to keep quiet. I'm not going to look the other way. I'm not going to forget. I'm going to remember that this is a problem for you. And if you don't want to own that as your problem, okay, that's your choice. But I will not partner with you on this. And I think that's so powerful, both for her part, because she knows what she needs to do about her problem then. Okay, I need to separate. I'm sad. It makes me sad that he won't work on it. But now I'm not spinning my wheels trying to solve his problem, which he has no interest in solving. That's so powerful. That last statement, especially sometimes, you know, Scott Peck said that mental health is a commitment to reality at all costs. People go, yeah, I know it's commitment to reality. No, it is a commitment to reality at all costs. And the idea of looking and saying, am I co-signing or going allow or giving you, is that really grace for the fifth time or is it license? Paul already addressed that in Romans. Fact is you sin, grace is much more abound, but he knew what we would do. Well, then how about I continue to sin that grace may more abound and Greek may genoiter may it never, never, never be. No, so I know what you guys are going to do. I'm actually not doing grace anymore. I'm enabling you to continue on. And that hitting of bottom, my experiences, can't prove it, but my experiences, most people, when they do what they call hitting bottom, it's because of another person's intervention or boundary. It's not as much of I hitting my own bottom. So the wife says, you don't believe this is coming. I'm leaving. I've got support or I'm taking the kids. That's dicey. Some women that say, I can't afford it. I didn't, none of this is easy. But then the guy goes, whoa, she's just stayed and all this. And I've acted out again. She comes back and they'll, they'll see literally a wake up call. It's like, whoa, what's going on? And it's like, yeah, 
And what I call this, I've coined a term for me, it works, that what's going on for a lot of women in these situations, what I call relational vertigo. Vertigo where they're like, whoa, what's happening here? I'm disoriented, right? My eyes, I can't. And there's a relational or verbal and emotional vertigo that they are literally kind of spinning. And I'm saying sometimes to get around and know I'm not going to put myself in these relational vertigo things again. Um, that's the one's own self-care to go forward where it is. And then they get to make it up as they go along. And usually a woman will decide, this is what I think I really need to do to go forward. And for our population, Jim, having a woman decide, mm -hmm. have a choice, instead of just submit and do what everybody tells her to do, yep. is part of her growth as an adult yes. person. Mm -hmm. right, of taking some ownership and agency for her own well-being in her own life. And that's part of go a good thing that can come out of this is totally. really growing into that space. See, Jessica submitted to me, hupotasso in Greek. She submitted to me, and I use this as a corny thing. Sub means under, mission means mission. I want to get under God's mission for my spouse. That's my, well, that's not the whole thing on submission. But one of the great submissions is I'm submitting to you so much and honoring you in agape love so much that I'm saying no, like Nehemiah did when Sam Ballot and Tobiah were saying, come down here and let's talk and let's do this. And they were, and he said, no, because they intended to do me harm. So I said, why should I stop the work I'm doing and come down to you and go down to what you're trying to do? And so that piece is to get to really submit to a guy when Jessica for me is like, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not going to do this anymore. <clears throat> that was one of the greatest things to say, Jim, your work, if I do that and I am not helping you as the Ezra Konegdo, that strong, suitable helper, then um, I'm not doing it anymore. And that was a good wake-up call for me. So let's say that that begins to happen. The couple has come to you for an intensive or they've gone somewhere else. What are some of the signs that you would help a woman know her husband is really changing. What are some of the signs? We talked about that self-awareness that, mm -hmm. oh, he catches himself in the middle of a fit or a middle of a temptation or he catches himself and yeah. he reels it back or he confesses it instead of her catching it. He says, you know what? I didn't turn the TV off last night. I should have, and I'm really sorry. And I've got to have more accountability there. Yeah. And he is aware of himself. So that self-awareness and that ability to be open where he's struggling is certainly part of the process. But what other signs? would she see that you've seen that you think would be helpful for her to know that someone is changing? Well, yeah, thank you, Leslie. I, I want to just concretize, just put in concrete the self-awareness. I was doing some reading uh, not terribly long ago that maybe the number one thing any counseling situation should do is we, we need, the, maybe the most important issue is to get self-awareness. So Solomon talked about, although he ended in disaster later, which shows uh, but he talked about the self-deceived man in uh, who lays an ambush for his own soul. He's not self-aware. Uh, and Socrates said, know thyself. So that idea is look for, to start with that, which you've said eloquently, look for the self-awareness. Does he stop himself? Say, wait a minute. Uh, I, emotional self-regulation. You know, can I, babe, can I back that up? Look for the self-awareness. Secondly is, just a simple word, is he doing his work? I'm not against him going to meet with a pastor, but sometimes you need someone, you know, there are people out there saying like in his ear that he's reporting back, she needs to forgive you or whatever. Is he dealing with his own, whatever you want to call it, his own life story, his own trauma story? Is he doing that? Because what he didn't work out, he'll act out. Is he doing five sessions and he quits? I'm healed. Is he doing that work? I look for two major things that come out of the word of God for a guy. These are signs to look for, for a wife, for a partner. Willingness. I'm willing I humble myself. Rich young ruler sounded willing to go to therapy with Jesus and change everything. Jesus said, but this is what you'll have to give up. And he went away sad. So he came willing. It looked like it, but Jesus said, but this is what we're caught. And that costs too much. Some guys are willing because they got busted early on. And then this is a longer process of rebuilding. Is he willing? And the second thing is not be humble. You're a humble person, but what? Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Humility, does the guy seem humble? Will he humble himself? Secondly, is he willing to go the long haul? When I, well, the biggest thing I see with a guy, you want to check engine light, is, okay, uh, I've changed. And I tell people, that's the law of promotion. You don't want that, the law of attraction. I will change and let the wife say, you seem different. So is he promoting himself? Is he getting frustrated? I mean, how long are we going to stay? 
all like that and not circling back to make the amends. I'm sorry. That's my impatience. Does he have support? Who does he have support? I would like the wife to somewhat know who these people are who are his support team. And is anybody on that support team back to Nehemiah chapter three, everybody's rebuilding. And it says, but the leaders of Tekoa refused to leave, uh, refused to lift a finger. They refused to help. Are there any people in his life saying she needs to be forgiven you by now? She ought to be back. She ought to be giving you sex by now. And I wonder if she says, and somehow she finds out these people could be his own family, whatever, are saying, you know, we, we need to move this thing down the road. Certainly it could be church people, church leaders. I wanted to assess for that and just to trust her intuition at one level. Does he feel like he's changing? I have guys, if they've been in immorality, we ask him to take in our field a 90-day sexual detox. No pleasure, sex with self or porn, and no sex with wife because we let every other addict detox and not him. And is he just mad and like, uh, we, we need to be having sex? Is he trying to hijack a connection and get back quickly? Look for his patience. Look for the fruit of the Spirit observable data in his life and again if he makes a mistake sins whatever does he say i need to correct that honey does he confess it those are some of the signs i look for yeah those are wonderful one sign that we look for and it's a simple one is how does he handle your no how does he handle your no yeah because oftentimes, uh, at least in our population where there's more narcissism and entitlement and all of that, it's, hey, you're not allowed to say no. You're the wife. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to always do what I want. And so part of his growth is learning that we're in a partnership. We're in a relationship where I need to care about you as much Love as I that. want you to care about me. And so when she says, no, I'm not ready for you to move back home or no, I'm not ready to have sex with you or no, I don't quite trust you yet. How does he handle that? Is he gracious? Does he understand? Of course, I understand you don't trust me yet. I'm grateful that you're even There's willing to work I, on trying to trust me. Right. I tell guys all the time that I say, lean forward, but don't be a manipulator and say, babe, you shouldn't trust anything I'm saying. How do you know when an unfaithful man is lying, when his lips are moving? moving? So it's like, you, you shouldn't trust me. I literally do want to earn that trust back. Trust, but verify. And no is a complete sentence. A wife, children explain, right? Adults inform for a wife to say, no, I don't have that to give. And I tell husbands a sign as I coach. I use it in my own life. You'll hear me say it is, do you have this to give? I'd like this. I have a request. Now sit back. Do you have this to give? And she says, no. I ask. We're adults. Talk about emotional self-regulation. You said no. No is a complete sentence. You need not say more. And see, I brilliantly stated by you, how does he handle a no? Because that's a sign is the little tiny narcissist running the ship. Or the little boy who's underneath all that, a kid in the candy stores, I'm mad, mommy, give me my candy back. I've behaved. I made all A's. Good. I'm glad you did. You're in great recovery. But this is AA calls it a character defect. You need to, when Nehemiah in the rebuilding, they've closed the gates. I mean, they, they built the walls. And then it says very important, and we close the breaches. I tell men, you've got to close the breaches in your life. Romans 13, 14, make no provision for the lusts of the flesh. This is not all the big stop in the sexual acting out is actually fairly easy. It's the breaches like that's a I can make provision for the lust of the flesh there or there. And then Nehemiah puts in parentheses, we closed the breaches. We rebuilt the wall. We're done. And it says, although yet we had not hung the doors, he put in parentheses on the gates. That's the man's internal ongoing character development, progressive sanctification that we think in our fields probably five years to keep going. And is he doing his work, whether she comes back or not? or not? Right, right. The work isn't done for him to win her back. The work is done because yeah. he doesn't want to be that That's kind right. of man. Just like you said, when Larry said, is there a part of you that doesn't want to do this? And it yeah. wasn't about Jessica and her boundary at the time. That's it was right. about, I don't want to be this kind of man. That's and right. that's what we want to look for. Would you pray for our women before we go? Yeah, I would love to. Thank you. Oh, it'd be a pleasure. Father in heaven, thank you for your love for us, your kindness, your mercy. Your mercies are new every morning. You're the one that thought up relationships because it mirrors the Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you've called us to walk in integrity. You've called us into those who are married that it's actually a picture to the world of Christ and his bride. You thought up that. You thought up forgiveness. You thought up boundaries. And so, God, I pray today, especially for women who are here and who are listening, and first, thank you, God, that I get to maybe say something that would be helpful. And thank you for Leslie for letting me do this. But I pray for the peace of Christ that would pass all understanding. 
for a woman, no matter what her husband or an ex or anyone else is doing. I pray for wisdom, which you say you giveth liberally and upbraideth not, that you would grant wisdom to women today. I pray for women, Lord, that they would believe what they see. When they see a sign, they wouldn't think, eh, that, Lord, that they would say, I see what I see. Having eyes to see, having ears to hear, Lord, they would trust what they're seeing, and they can verify too. I plead, Lord, the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony over anyone hearing this today. I pray, uh, I do pray, Lord, it's one of the, the most important things for me, Lord. There'd be some people today listening, male or female, husband or wife, whoever, married or divorced or single, that they would do some renouncements today of anything left over from their life story, abuse, things that happened, maybe secrets they have never shared with anyone. And God, that they would renounce any trauma bonds, any things going on, soul ties, any any beliefs of shame about themselves, and it wasn't their fault how they were betrayed, that they would renounce those and take every thought captive, but make it obedient to you, Christ. They would say, Jesus, this old thought, this wrong, toxic thought, this belief that's wrong, it's a lie, that they would take those captive and say, Jesus, these lies in my story, and even what my husband has done to me, they bow to the name of, and the knee, I bow the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ, that they would bow to those, taking every thought captive. By doing that, they take and de demolish strongholds in their lives. And I pray with them, First John one seven. But if we walk in the in the light, Lord, out of the darkness, out of the out of the shadows, but if we walk in the light as He, Jesus, is in the light, it is there we can connect and have fellowship one with another. And then you said, in the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son cleanses us from all sin. May they feel clean today as they confess, as they have healthy boundaries. May they walk in newness of life and what they're doing. And I pray this, Lord, in the name of you, Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Jim, thank you so much. I know you're in the middle of an intensive, so I so appreciate the time that oh, you've carved pleasure. out to help my audience learn the real truth about sexual addiction. Thanks. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you for listening to Relationship Truth Unfiltered. If you need clarity on whether your marriage is difficult, disappointing, or destructive, go to leslievernick.com forward slash start for Leslie's free quick start guide. It's totally private and will help you get clear on your next step. Again, that's lesliebernick.com forward slash start. Until next time, may God bless your relationships with him, with yourself, and with others.